The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank and praise you for another day we can get together as family and discuss your word. Thank you that you work through your living word to create faith in us and to sustain it and to make us strong. Seal us by your spirit in that one true faith that we may one day receive the crown of glory that awaits all the saints who remain steadfast. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Good Amen. stuff. All right, we are on the unit, the chapter on church. We welcome visitors and guests and say hello to you and greet you in the Lord. Um, we are on page 406. If you have the book, Call to Believe, Teach and Confess. Um, this is a summary overview of doctrine. It is not meant to be every aspect. And certainly within the the time constraints of, a, of class, individual class periods, there's no way to cover everything. But we are covering... Um, a few major points as we go through the doctrines of the church. Uh, the priesthood is on page um, 406. And um, fairly recently, in terms of not years ago, uh, the Commission on Theology and Church Relations, CTCR, released a document on the priesthood of all believers that goes into quite a bit of detail um, about this notion of the priesthood and what does it mean and what does it um, not mean. There's a lot of confusion about this. And in, 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 in our local context, we have interaction with other churches sometimes that teach that everybody's a pastor because we're all the priesthood of all believers. Everybody can preach, everybody can distribute communion, and that's even among those, some of those who, who even take a sacramental uh, view of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which is very much in the minority out here. But uh, at any rate, we're going to talk about what all of this means in the context of the book and let the book lead the discussion. Um, the book says most of the world's religions have some kind of concept of the priesthood, uh, of a priesthood. Um, a priest is an intermediary between a god um, and man, <clears throat> and they serve as go-betweens. Um, the book also defines the word religion as to reconnect or uh, rejoin. And that priests help in that process of connecting or joining to God. They're mediators um, between God or God or gods and and man. Even in non-Christian religion, in other words, uh, in the Old Testament, the priesthood served a specific function as a go-between uh, between God and man. The priest was that like that stand-in. So the priest would offer sacrifice on behalf of the people. Um, but uh, also some priests, um, who are also prophets, were spoken to by God to deliver messages um, directly to the people. And of course their job is always to proclaim the word of God, so they always serve in that function of, here's, here's God, he's separated from people, not because he wants that, but because our sin does that. And in that gulf or breach steps the priest. The Old Testament priest is a, is a prototype pointing forward to the real um, priest, especially high priest, Jesus. Priests served as mediators to God. They offered sacrifices in the temple. They brought the prayers of the people before God. God is very specific about the priesthood, especially in Exodus, um, about what, what that is and who those folks are, Exodus 25 to 30, a good five chapters um, on the priesthood itself. He designed the tabernacle where they performed their duties. This is something um, I wonder how many people kind of just in, in general realize. That God gave specific instructions for the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. Like, this is what it shall be. Make it out of this. Make it like this. Here are the design parameters and so forth. Um, and he said he had moved the hearts of various craftsmen and given them the creativity and the ideas to make what he wanted made and so forth. Uh, it's very, very, very specific. You know, and, and the areas of that uh, are very specific as well. Yes. I have one comment about that, which is that you sometimes hear people say that, uh, and I don't know how, how sincere they are about it, but they say things like the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament, or he's angry oh. or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I have found that understanding some of the um, you know, the order of worship as it's, as it's defined in the Old Testament and all of the things that you're talking about, all those specific things, 
and how that points forward to the eventual fulfillment of that or the, the change in the nature of that once, once Christ has come and has, has paid for, for that gulf of sin. Um, I find that that's a, a great, personally I found that to be a great linkage between those two and to say, you know, it, it actually is really all the same. There's one word of God and it was from the beginning all the way through to the New Testament. The, the other thing about that is that, um, and, and maybe I actually don't have my book with me, but um, I, we might get into kind of some of the specifics of what those things are, you know, the curtain and the holy of holies and, and all of that being separate from the people. And I think we've, we've talked in the past about that being, uh, you know, representative, but I actually heard something this past week, uh, re representative of how sin separates us from God. But I actually heard something this week also further to that, which was something that um, Will Whedon, Pastor Will Whedon, who is, uh, I believe, our director of worship, I think, uh -huh. for the LCMS, and he did, a, he did an interview in 2012 where they were talking about this, and he said, you know, uh, this is set up for the protection of God's people because uh, for, for their actual survivability in the presence of God because sinful people are essentially burned away, you know, with, with the holy purity of God yeah. um, and and you cannot approach that yeah and so I think we've we've talked in the past about oh yeah well it, you know it's representative and there's a sin but I had never heard it described before as actually for the protection of the people to be in some form or fashion in the presence of God and I found that really interesting right so in in that we have this idea of Old Testament and New Testament God um, I was looking up real quick to double check that it was Marcion because all these names and these very you can't track every heresy it's impossible there are too many there's as many heresies almost as there are people right uh, but Marcion and then the idea of um, you know separation from a holy God I'll put that over here to make sure that we can we can come back to that and then with regard to the parts and the pieces of the temple yeah we've um, we've done that and, and it would be good to do that again, um, especially in the context of recognizing and learning about, learning about and recognizing the New Testament fulfillments of those Old Testament types. Yes, um, please. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. Church isn't random, sanctuary is not random, you know, there's a thing. So, so Marcion is, is an early uh, Gnostic, okay? And Gnostics were dualists. Um, ah, reversed my uh, A and my U. Dualism. And we're just going to summarize here for the sake of discussion. Gnostic from the Greek word of for knowledge, Gnosis, secret knowledge. The Gnostics claimed to have secret knowledge. You had to go to them to get that secret knowledge. Um, they were a particular threat to early Christianity. Um, Christianity was not the only religion threatened by Gnosticism. Um, Greek dualism actually threatened, they would, you know, these guys would move into an area, kind of learn the local um, religion, and then begin to claim, we have secret knowledge about your religion that you don't have, and you have to come to us to get that. And then they would apply dualism to, you know, anyway. Um, that's how they kind of supported themselves and spread. They were, they were particularly uh, insidious with regard to, um, to the early church. There are people who say Simon Magus um, in Acts of the Apostles is sort of possibly even kind of a, a prototype or the, the founder, uh, if you will, of Gnosticism in terms of its, its danger to the church. I don't know about that. Was he Gnostic? Yeah, maybe, probably, but uh, this Gnosticism and dualism, that, that predates Christianity. Anyway, Marcion's particular application of Gnosticism to the Bible, oh, uh, let me back up. The dualism that we're talking about, and, and kind of oversimplifying on purpose, is material things, material things equal bad, you know, and um, supernatural or non-corporeal things, well, they're good. So if you apply that dualism, for example, to human beings, you get flesh bad, spirit good, and this uh, sort of influences the notion down the line uh, of the mortification of the flesh that would be pleasing to God. 
if you know, if, if uh, as a particular kind of monk or whatever, I go down the street, you know, flailing myself, whipping myself till I bleed. Um, uh, what movie? The movie is um, uh, Monty Python. Um, and the Holy Grail. Where the, 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 the monks are all. Oh uh, yeah, they uh, hit the themselves in the yeah. face. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, um, that's that idea that somehow punishing the flesh would please God is kind of bizarre. We're, you know, first article, we're created, um, we're created beings, uh, body and soul. So things aren't automatically bad because they're material and not automatically good because they're supernatural. Um, so Marcion takes and divides kind of the Old Testament God from the New Testament God. The Old Testament God is bad because he created material things. New Testament God is trying to rescue us out of that. And there's kind of a lingering um, dualism in Eastern Orthodoxy today. And you know, that's uh, another discussion. Can't go into super detail about that. But yeah, this is a thing dividing artificially the Old Testament God or the God of the Old Testament from the God of the New Testament. Completely bogus. Um, that's one and the same God. And it's a, it's a complete... Well, you know what it is? It's the magisterial use of reason forcing dualism onto Scripture instead of the ministerial use of reason, where reason is subject to the Word of God, and we believe that we may know. Then, then now we've got things in the right order. But, but hammering, you know, squashing Scripture under dualism gets you all, all sideways. And that's, and that's kind of what was going on here. The, the, right, and the separation uh, necessary uh, between God and people is because of the sin of people and not God. God is a holy God. He tells Moses, none shall see my face and live. Um, and so he protects Moses in a, when Moses wants to see his glory, protects Moses in a cleft of rock so that Moses can only see the back of him or whatever. Um, and the tabernacle design reflects this. There is a holy of holies. So within the tent of meeting, there are kind of two areas. About, about two-thirds of it is the holy place where the people can go. But the holy of holies, or the most holy place behind this, it's called screen or veil, the curtain, is where the people can't go. In fact, only the high priest can go in only one time a year on the Day of Atonement to make atonement for the sins of the people. And that's kind of where the, the Shekinah glory of God dwells on the mercy seat is in the holy of holies. He's utterly, in fact, he's so set apart from our sin and kind of unapproachable because this curtain is there, right? That um, the, the areas provided for are, there's the, the Holy of Holies. So there's the Holy of Holies. Let's just say it's like maybe this side. Then there's the Holy Place. This is the Tent of Meeting. And then there's even farther out, there's the Courtyard. And then you have to pass through a gate with a veil to even get into the courtyard. So there's this kind of a fence all the way around. And then the, Israel is camped, and God even gives the locations for the tribes to encamp around on the outside at a distance because they're so separated from a holy God by their sin. So as they pass through the veil and the entrance here, you've got um, first... Uh, the bronze altar, the altar of sacrifice, where the, the burnt offerings are given. Then you've got the, um, it was called, nicknamed the sea, the bowl or basin where the baptisms were done. So you've got to make this animal sacrifice for sin, get this cleansing, come through, and then you come through into here. And then there are things in here. Uh, there's the, the menorah is here, and I won't do this correctly, so apologies, but yeah. <laughs> That sort of looks like a cactus. Um, and then there's the table of showbread. And then there's the, um, the altar of incense for the prayers of the people. And then you have the Holy of Holies, you know, with the Ark of the Covenant. Question. Mm -hmm. the, um, the baptismal thing or whatever. Yeah. Uh -huh. Was that for the priest before uh -huh. they went in? Yeah, that's right. In fact, in fact, in fact, um, when God is setting all of this up and giving all of these instructions... When Mo, uh, Aaron and his sons are consecrated first to be priests, they first have to go through the basin, then put on the priestly garments, then be anointed and, as, uh, and consecrated as priests to serve before God Most High. And then, yes, this continues. 
when you come in for your time of service, before you can serve as a priest, right. you have to be washed again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all of this, there, these are old, this is Old Testament typology. This is all pointing forward to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So there is no more animal sacrifice because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. His death once for all actually pays for sin that the blood of bulls and goats and so forth could not pay for. You're not washed every time now. You're baptized once. And you are buried with Christ and raised with him in that baptism to new life. You know, when you come into the holy place... There's no more veil. That veil was rent, which is an analog to the flesh of Christ being rent for you so that you can approach the throne of grace with confidence, etc. And, and Hebrews, the epistle of Hebrews, is phenomenal in working all of this uh, out for us. Yes. Uh, is, that, is that baptism that we're talking about for priests and, and maybe even for people, uh, is that the same baptism that John would have been doing? Or, I mean, what, how... Just that it's a little bit of a side great, branch. No, but, no, it's a great question. Yeah. So there were lots of ritual washings. Uh, the baptism that John is doing isn't here in the temple compound at the basin. He's out at the Jordan River uh, doing a washing of repentance in preparation as the forerunner, in preparation for the actual the ministry of the Lord. And it seems, I can't pinpoint prove it, it seems from the language of Scripture, he's in the general location where Israel would have passed over into the promised land from on, on their journey so that you get all of this symbolism um, at the Jordan with the washing, the repentance, being part of the people of God, entering the promised land, etc. That's what he, he seems to be doing. And that baptism, just for review, because we've done this part before, is not the same as Christian baptism that you had. Paul, for example, indicates that when he meets disciples of John in Ephesus in late in Acts of the Apostles, um, and they were baptized into John's baptism, but they never heard there was a Holy Spirit. And they hadn't been baptized into Christ. Paul immediately baptizes them into Christ. Yeah. Um, so those baptisms that would have been something more like this, which would have, which would have been sort of uh, as you as you need it, which is a lot sort of baptism that yeah, you would sort of keep repeatedly over and over and over since it doesn't really wash away your sin. Yeah. Um, all of these things and, and don't of themselves do anything. In other words, they're not, they're not means of grace. They're typology pointing forward to what, will, what Christ will fulfill. None of this has anything to do with pleasing God, earning his favor, being worthy, and all of that. It's getting a people ready for what Christ is going to do. Yeah, and they're yes. going to see it and go, oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it confronts us with our sin. You know, the, the screaming and the dying of the animals and the blood everywhere and the gore just kind of points out that the, 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 the wages of sin is death. You know, and the, 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 the life is in the blood and, the, and the, there's got to be a, a payment for sin and that's temporarily wreaking havoc on the animals of Israel until Christ becomes a sacrifice for us. The washing away in this this understanding that we're covered in our own filth and sin, and that God way in here, so separated away from us, is holy. And there are all of these things that need to be done because we're not. Kind of an idea. Are the animals bathed in that also? Are they what? Bathed, washed in that also. Oh after, no, after, after their sacrifice. Mm -hmm. No, just just the just the people. Okay. Yeah, just people. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a really good question. And then, so the, the lamp has had to be the finest, purest olive oil and had to always be lit and always be burning. Uh, not only is this typology representing the, the, the Holy Spirit, but that the people of God are to be a light of the nations. They regularly fail, etc. But um, that's kind of what's going on here. Um, you have the altar of incense representing the prayers of the people going up to God, but it's tended by a priest as a as a mediator, and the showbread, the table of showbread, which had the, constantly had a, a baked loaf of bread on it as a reminder that God is the provider. Uh, he's, you know, the, he's, he gives us the, the, our daily bread, etc. Um, and you have all of these things are, are, are Old Testament analogs pointing forward to Christ. You know, when the, the Ark of the Covenant today, obviously we don't have upstairs, 
in the sanctuary. We have an altar table, which sort of combines these things. We're not re-sacrificing Christ. His sacrifice was once for all. Um, the mercy seat is essentially, if you will, analogous to the top of the altar table, which is why we bow in reverence in that direction toward that altar table, not worshiping the table or something like that, but displaying respect for what happens there, what comes to us um, from there. There's no curtain upstairs. There's a communion rail, but it has openings. You know, you can approach the throne of grace. It's not a mystery what's in there. You're not separated from God. You can approach with confidence. <coughs> the altar of incense, we have used incense on special occasions, and we always get grief for it, but we do it anyway. Um, but incense simply still represents the prayers of the saints ascending um, to heaven. Table of showbread, I guess this also is sort of brought, all of these are brought into this. You know, it's, it's got sort of got these Eucharistic overtones. The light, we have candles. Um, baptismal font, you get the idea, you know, so everything upstairs has a purpose, and um, it's a fulfillment of Old Testament typology, and everything is pointing to Christ. That's why Lutheran churches aren't just random rooms, or empty boxes, or um, stages for performance, those kinds of things, Th those are other things, that's not, that's not what we do, yeah. Does that make sense? Does that help mm -hmm. explain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the Old Testament, New Testament uh, dualism and Holy God and uh, the tabernacle. So the, um, there were priests, uh, there were some priests actually before Exodus. I find this absolutely fascinating. Of course, Melchizedek is the one that jumps immediately to mind. Um, he just um, appears. Poof. Well, Jethro. Jethro? Yeah, father. Uh, yeah, the fa so Moses' father-in-law um, is priest of Midian. You're like, huh? Priest of what? Who? What? You know? Yeah, he's um, he's priest of Midian, and uh, he gives he comes and gives that great advice to Moses about how to serve the Lord um, faithfully and better by by having elders appointed and so forth. But yeah, uh, these guys exist. They're rare, but they are uh, they are out there. Um. Aaron and his sons are to be priests um, forever. They're to be priests in uh, Exodus 30. And, and this is where we begin to kind of understand, although it's obvious also from the fact that there are patriarchs um, and that the priests are guys, Melchizedek, uh, Jethro, um, that these, according to the created order, they're male. There's male headship. Um, there's male headship in the family. Adam is the first pastor, essentially, to his family. Um, and that these, those who serve in this capacity um, are, are, in fact, um, male. From generation to generation, they're, they're always male. That's just the start of it. That's not the only part, but it's always tied to the created order. Everything in Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, that restricts the office of the ministry to men is, is based on the created order. Yeah. The priesthood was not God's final solution. Okay? It was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. All right? The book um, continues. Um, he's the perfect and greatest sacrifice because he offers his own body. No more sacrifices um, will be needed. Uh, he also, um, Jesus continues to um, serve as our great high priest by mediating on our behalf. Therefore, we don't pray to Mary, we don't pray to saints, we don't uh, pray to anyone or anything, um, because there's only one mediator between um, God and man, the man Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 2.5. Um, and that's a, that's a big deal. That's very, very, very um, important as well. Um, the priesthood, and what is a priest, is described in Hebrews 4 and 5. And I think one of the key understandings presented, for example, in Hebrews 5 is that no one takes this upon himself, but only is called by God. It point blank says that Hebrews 5 verse 4. So a person, for example, does not become a pastor by feeling like God has called them. That's a noble thing. That's, that's 
I, I don't want to make light of that. That's what we would call an internal call, having kind of a sense that maybe the Lord wants me to serve in this capacity. However, that remains an internal call and little more than a feeling or a sense until and only if called externally by God through a congregation. That's what makes one a pastor. And it makes one a pastor whether or not one's been to seminary. Seminary doesn't make you a pastor. Seminary forms and trains you to the standards of a church body. But seminary doesn't make you a pastor. It, it's, it could happen, and it does happen once in a blue moon. Somebody can go all the way through seminary, and either they discover or the faculty discovers that they really probably shouldn't serve as a pastor. Or they don't get a call. God doesn't call them. That happens. It's rare. It happens. Um, it's just a reminder that a, a pastor is one called uh, by God to serve externally. It's not a feeling from the person. It's not the, the result of a specific training program. You know, if there are, we've talked before about the uh, couple of Christians on an island thing. You know, I forgot how Augustine put this exactly. I think his was a shipwreck or something. That one can baptize the other, then the other becomes the pastor of the one who baptized him or something like that. Anyway, um, where two or three are gathered in the name of Christ, that's a Christian congregation, and they have the right and authority to call their pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in the LC, just to kind of clarify, in the LCMS, um, because we voluntarily belong to that church body as a congregation, we accept the standards for filling the office of holy ministry, which means we accept, as an LCMS congregation, that we'll only call a pastor trained and certified by the LCMS. You know, in the LCMS, we participate with the rest of the congregations in the LCMS in determining what is that program of instruction. And right now, that's seminary. It's a rigorous seminary program that includes a one-year internship. And that's pass-fail, which is pretty horrifying. Um, and um, should you, and, 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 and it's not just, oh yeah, you know, go to seminary. Oh yeah, you know, it's a graduate program. Yeah, go. No, it's you have to maintain a certain minimum GPA, grade level, in every single thing you take, or uh, you go on probation, ultimately could get bounced. So you, there's, so it's very rigorous. It's for the protection of the congregation. It doesn't automatically mean the person they get is best pastor ever, or even, even going to be a good pastor. It doesn't mean, but it does mean that at the, at the minimum, to the best of our broken abilities under God's grace, we've got this minimum level of academic standing. This person's completed these tasks, and then academically and informationally, they're qualified. The point of the one-year internship is to watch how they do um, pastor stuff under supervision. Not that they can fulfill that office, I'm not saying that. But they serve under supervision, and they do some pastor, they work with people, and they're observed one-on-one -on -one from a qualified supervising pastor, and the whole thing's under pass fail. You can only, you fail that once, and they're willing to accept, it may have been a personality issue, maybe, and give you one more try. Fail that, you're done. It doesn't matter how good your academics are. If you've messed that up a second time, you're done. So these rigorous standards are in place to protect congregation. Can a problem still happen? Yeah, because we're broken, we're sinful, we don't rely on us, we rely on God. That's also why a congregation um, is under responsibility to observe their pastor and to work with him on his own proclamation of the gospel, meaning theology. You know, to ask these questions and get explanations, and, and the elders um, are charged in every congregation of watching over the theology of the pastor. You know, so that they can say with confidence, yes, he's solid, you know. And if he makes a mistake, which is entirely possible for human beings to do. Oh, a human being make a mistake? Never. Or no, oh wait, when you put on the holy flea collar, you're suddenly exempt from mistakes. <laughs> Yay! You know, and there are people who try to hold you to that standard, and thank God literally that, that people here are aware and don't. Um, but should you stumble or, or mess up, whatever, you've got people there who, who love the pastor, 
dearly you know, love their shepherd and their church and are willing to say, can, can you explain the guy I didn't quite understand? How did that work again? Can you, you know, they don't walk up with a bat and beat him over the head and say, you're a failure, you're wrong. You know, that's horrible. Okay, that kind of does happen in private sometimes. <laughs> but the elders don't do that, let me be clear. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many people know this, but would you explain the, the shirt color and the sure, collar? Because sure. I, think, I think that is a great thing yeah. to make. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I, I wear uh, the clerical most of the time. Unless I am doing something that's specifically, for example, as a family man with my family. Unless I'm doing something that is just um, me doing it. Everything I do with any reflection on the office, I, I'm in the collar and wear a clerical. The black of the shirt, as I was taught in the seminary, the black color of the shirt is a reference to the fact that the person wearing the shirt doesn't want any focus or attention on him. He's a sinner just like everybody else. This is not a separate class that is occupied. There isn't one. We're all the priesthood of all believers. Um, the white tab refers to the fact he's called by God through a congregation to proclaim the gospel. So the, the good stuff is the gospel, the grace, and so forth. That's all God. The rest is, is, is the man uh, who's uh, covered in sin just like everybody else and needs mountains of regular <coughs> forgiveness yeah, and mercy and grace. I think it's, um, and I can't remember where I saw this recently, also, but, um, and I think we've talked about this before too, but when you have a, a pastor, a shepherd in front of you speaking, um, as a congregation, you're to hear it as if it were directly from the mouth of God. Uh -huh. And I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing uh, that, that words, <coughs> words of ultimate truth yeah. can come from the mouth of a liar. Yeah, that's it. It's beautiful. That's it. Yeah. Um, uh, it, Nothing against you personally. No, no, no. Because, right, right, because what does the Bible say? Let God be proven true and all men be found liars. Um, and, and, and Luther uses the analogy of a bag of maggots. You know, that the holy and pure word of God, that he would suffer it to be projected through a bag of maggots is incredible and, and come out unstained. Even while the proclaimer has sin to be repented of daily and in the same need of forgiveness as everybody else, nonetheless, and that's why there's this, 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 uh, the tab is, uh, is all about, is all about that. And I've, um, as an aside, um, the clerical has been, other than my Bible, the second best evangelism tool I've, I've had. Um, my Bible starts the most conversations about God, and my clerical the second most. Because if I go, for example, uh, when I go to Haiti, I put on the clerical for the whole time because I'm going doing pastor stuff, but I'm also looking for opportunities for people to see the clerical and say, oh, hey, and it happens every time. I've had conversations on airplanes all over the place, um, people see the collar, and they will just sort of sit there for a minute, stare, look, can I ask you something? Yes, you can. Yeah, absolutely. People have stopped me at gas stations and asked for prayer. People have stopped me in restaurants. I had a guy um, yell down the hall of a hospital, I need a man of God. And I was like, me too. Oh, wait, he's talking about me. <laughs> and, um, he was it led a pretty rough life, hardcore party animal, dying uh, from it, and needed a man of God. And uh, went in there, and he wanted to confess his sins, and he wanted to be forgiven. He wanted somebody to tell him all about Jesus, and he wanted to uh, repent and amend his ways. And um, by God's grace, that man died a baptized believer. And um, so I don't take it lightly. Um, I, I get kind of ruffled, and that's my own brokenness. I get kind of ruffled um, at people that want to mock, you know, the collar, um, including other pastors who think it's more relational just to wear a golf shirt or whatever. Um, I, for one thing, I think it's probably 
um, second only to blasphemy against the Holy Spirit for a middle-aged man to wear skinny jeans, ever, especially <laughs> on an altar. Uh, but, um, you know, the whole, uh, the whole relevancy thing is a ridiculous argument um, because the Bible, the Word of God, is what's relevant always and in every place. Um, and if you think that there's any way whatsoever that some human means can be somehow added to it like it needs a booster or a help, that's a faith issue we should talk about. Um, that can be helped because the Word of God creates the faith that overcomes reliance on the flesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Is, is the pattern where a congregation calls a pastor church convention or is it found in acts or? oh yeah yeah acts uh-huh yeah so yeah scripture in generally speak yeah um so for, ooh, so for example um paul and barnabas in acts of the apostles it's really interesting because um you know the spirit kind of leads paul and them back to to uh, up to antioch up to antioch and there the the faithful you know the spirit kind of tells them set apart for me Paul and Barnabas, blah, blah, blah. And they lay hands on them, and then they're off on the missionary journeys. This is Paul, you know? Um, so, yeah, yeah, the congregation. Where there exists a congregation, there exists the right of those Christians to uh, have a shepherd and, uh, and to, call, to call. Now, a lot of times in the New Testament, those are appointed. Yeah. So Paul will say, you yeah, know, go ahead, go appoint elders in every city. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times they're appointed by the church, so either or. Is, is biblical. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Uh, I just wanted to comment with sure. back, back to the, the shirt and the collar. Yeah, remember, um, black is the color of a clerical. Everything else is just a Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> um, Send so, those angry comments to Jeremy. <laughs> no, no, no. I like a good Hawaiian shirt. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, but... So as far as, as far as the responsibility of, of a pastor, I mean, you talked about it in your sermon a little bit earlier today. I mean, there's, yeah. it's, you know, um, uh, you respect the pastor, the, yeah. you know, uh, yep. double... Um, yeah, worthy of double honor. Double honor, but of course yeah. there's a huge weight and responsibility. And being yeah. in public and having somebody flag you down for your vocation, like there's a yep. responsibility there. I just wanted to suggest also that in the, in the sense of priesthood of all believers... In some ways, the only thing that separates us in public from somebody wearing a clerical like that is the fact that we're not wearing a clerical. But in other ways, so, so we don't we don't have that benefit, I guess. Um, we don't also carry the responsibility, yeah. but we should strive in our way to be visible oh, yeah. to people around us that yeah. we also are able to speak. You know, I'm, we can wear any color shirt, I guess, yep. but we would want to speak that white collar as much as we possibly could, that true word as much as we could to those Yeah, that's individuals. a really good point. Yeah, because um, Scripture um, tells us um, that we are, um, we are always, we need to be ready to give, uh, you know, a defense for the, our, yeah, defense, for the, for the hope that we have to do so with gentleness and respect. Um, it, it does tell us that we are to be above reproach. Not per, it doesn't say perfect. It says above reproach. So we're not publicly and, and repeatedly engaging in public sin to the point where we're like, wait a minute. You know, what are you talking about? You know, like that. But yeah, we as Christians, we all bear that. But you're right, there is a different standard. Uh, James writes, not many of you should desire to be teachers, uh, brothers, for those of you that do will be held to a higher standard, more difficult standard. And you, and you are. And, and it doesn't just mean by people, but of course by God. But yes, but yes, also by people. I mean, imagine getting up every Sunday to, to um, you know, exposit, to, to teach on the readings of that day and have a hundred and something or whatever critics <laughs> potentially ready for each one of them to say, well, that isn't what I came to hear. Now, fortunately, the vast majority of the hearers are people who get, they're aware Christians. They get the Holy Spirit works through that same proclaimed word individually in the hearts of people, sometimes applying uh, more law to some than others or more gospel to some than others. Etc. And, and, you, and we're not there to be entertained and so forth. We get all of that. And fortunately, the vast majority of people do. That doesn't prevent, say, a handful or whatever 
from always wanting to uh, to rip you know the guy up front. So which is, is which is which is also human nature. If you've ever worked on somebody's car and someone's kind of looking over your shoulder, yeah. or if you've ever been in the kitchen yeah. cooking someone yeah. and someone says, "Well, that's going to turn out a little dry," or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's and, it's, it, it, and that and it is human nature because it's the easiest thing to do to criticize. The hardest thing to do is what we're called to do: love one another as Christ has loved us. Ooh, uh. and that doesn't mean there aren't constructive things to say and necessary times to say them. That's not what that means. But, but, just, but just to criticize is the easiest thing to do. Fault can be found with anyone, anytime, anyplace. Um, someone said, I don't know who it was, if it was Mark Twain or who it was, for example, like when you, you social media and so forth, nothing can be written so well that it can't be attacked and taken apart and you know, so forth. So, and that's kind of like what... Uh, what service in the office um, can be as well. By the way, I was quoting the, the sainted Reverend Dr. Uh, Ronald Feuerhahn when I said, the only clerical is black, the rest are Hawaiian shirts, because he literally said that. Um, he, was, he was big on reverence and formality. Um, he was very big on what this stands for. He did not dig um, other, and he would let you know. It just it, If you, you know, because when you serve as a vicar, you serve in field work assignments or whatever, you go out in clerical. So if you came back from that and had to go to one of his classes, you had best be a black. Because he would send you home. <laughs> he, you go change, and when you have the right concept and displaying the right message, you can, you can come back. He's an amazing guy, one of the best ever, just ever. He would, he would in class, um, he taught things like the history of Western philosophy. And he would rattle this stuff off from memory. You'd just be like, uh, 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 you know. He was amazing, but he was also super mega pastoral. So he would like teach from behind the desk and the podium. But when he had something to tell us about pastoral ministry, he'd walk around the front and he'd sit on the edge of the desk and he'd cross his arms and he'd say, now gentlemen. And he had this yeah. deep baritone <laughs> and he'd been, he'd been to Cambridge. His PhD was from Cambridge. And he, and he had this sort of, even though he's American, he had sort of a, a little bit of a British accent. Now, gentlemen. And everybody knew what was coming next and that it was like gold. And you could hear, a, he'd say, now, gentlemen, you could hear a pin drop. You could hear dust gently falling to the floor because everyone's riveted, you know. He was just, but that was, and, that, and he, would, he would stop people because people would try the ha, 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 funny. They had blue, red, whatever, clerical for graduation to wear under the gown. He'd meet the line coming out and pull down and send him back. And he'd dare him to not go back. You're not going up there for graduation so you have a black clerical on. Yeah, it's awesome. I love him. He's a great guy. We need more like him. Yeah. Where was it? That was completely up there. Uh, all right. So, um, but yeah, and, and this is all incredibly important related. Oh, I know where I was going. Upstairs is a New Testament, uh, New Testament fulfillment, symbols of New Testament fulfillment, of this, you know, so we have a baptismal font, but now it's right up here, kind of in the position of the altar of incense, right in front of the Holy of Holies, the chancel, the chancel is the Holy of Holies, there's an altar table there, the light is in the chancel uh, as well, the candles are there, the showbread's in the chancel, but all of this is open, there's no veil, no curtain, no block, no blockage, nothing preventing, um, and this is gone because the cross took care of that. And yet you still have the same basic layout. Everything up there is on purpose. Oh, why do I wear vestments? Um, because, again, to cover the guy, hide the guy, impart uh, biblical truths and realities. Uh, but also, um, um, God commanded that vestments be made for Aaron <coughs> and his sons. And that they be consecrated. Part of their consecration was to have these vestments placed on them. Do we have to? No, it's not a law law, but they did, and there are really good reasons, you know, to do that. So we do that. Everything means something upstairs. Um, and I don't remember, I think we've done, but it's probably been a while, where we went through the Altar Guild Handbook and actually went through, and we'll do it again, go through all of this. Yeah. All right, very good. So, um... We talked about Christ um, as the great high priest. You know, the high priest uh, would lay his hands on the head of the, the goat, and which would be driven out into the wilderness to take away the sins of the people and go die. 
Jesus becomes both the high priest and the sacrifice by taking onto himself, into his flesh, our sin, and, and crushing, killing, canceling that um, on the cross. The high priest went into the Holy of Holies, but just once a year for the sins of the people. Jesus went to the cross one time, um, shed his blood um, for the sins of, of the people, etc., etc. We talked about rending the curtain, the curtain being his flesh, and, and so forth. There, the, when we talk about the priesthood of all, all believers, uh, from 1 Peter 2, uh, I mentioned earlier that there's some stumbling that goes on with regard to this and some misunderstanding that, well, because there's a priesthood of all believers, we're all pastors and we can all do pastor stuff. And there's kind of a yes and a no to this. For example, you also are preachers of the gospel. As Christians, as saints, you're supposed to be preaching, proclaiming Christ all over the place. In fact, um, this is a very important concept of evangelism, that sheep beget sheep. Shepherds feed the sheep, sheep beget sheep. You know, I train and equip and send. And it's not that I don't evangelize, I evangelize all the time. But, uh, the, but the church's understanding is to be that sheep beget sheep, and that you guys go out and you do. When you word people, you are preaching to them. No, it's not the sermon up front on behalf of the calling congregate. We get that. You're out in the world, you know. Every time you proclaim the gospel, you're preaching the gospel, men and women. Preach the gospel. Proclaim it. Everywhere you go. Yes? In that, in that uh -huh. line of thinking, I mean, you, your purpose preaching from the pulpit uh -huh. is primarily to equip the saints? or Equip and send. So well, I wouldn't say pri primarily equip, actually. Actually, let me back up. I would say primarily law and gospel for repentance and forgiveness of sins and to equip and send. Yeah. But you, I mean, primarily you, you expect that you're preaching to believers, right? I mean, it's... Uh-huh. Okay. You're, you're I, don't, I don't assume only believers right. because in the visible church there's authentic and inauthentic. Right. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I'm preaching to my, my anticipated audience is... Uh, the faithful, the saints. Uh -huh. Well, believers. it's like the churches uh -huh. in the New Testament. Uh huh. They were the gathering of believers. Uh huh. You know. Uh huh. And so, uh huh. And it was probably those that weren't quite sure about stuff, and they came anyway. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yep, that's right. That's right. And you always know there are visitors out there, and um, you know, biggest grace is I can still pretty much tell. Now, now that I've been here f over four years, now I can kind of. You know, uh, you, you can even even tell, you know, I saw somebody in church today I haven't seen probably in a year. and But knew, but knew they weren't visitors. They were, you know, I knew what was going on. Yeah. It, it takes a while, though, because there are, you know, so many variables. You know, you have people, these aren't visitors, they're family. Remember, they were here two years ago. Sure I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know, like that. But, okay. but then there was, a, there was a couple today with... Uh, a daughter, they were, in fact, visitors. Um, and uh, it was pretty neat. And they were, they just were so kind and nice. And they, they loved, you know, they said, you're so engaging. I said, praise God. I always say that it's very kind to come out when, when the, the, the sermon has touched you. The Spirit did that, not me. It's very kind to say to a pastor, I like that sermon. I did. That's very kind. That's very, we need encouragement too, because mostly we get criticized like everybody else. But I was, if you notice, I would say, oh, praise God, because I recognize that, for one thing, I'm directing all praise to God, but I also recognize that the good that happens is God, the bad is my mess-ups, right, according to the flesh, because I foul, foul things up. But they were very kind about it, very, and so I'm looking, and they said they're going to come back, so I'm looking forward to that. Nice young couple with a daughter, uh, wonderful people. I just wanted to comment with respect to that question. Um, it's probably important to remember the, the, the combination, uh, marks of the church, uh, word mm. and sacrament. So it's, yeah. uh, you know, although we can talk about, well, are you doing it to equip people? Or are you doing it to pro proclaim to people? It's, you know, the word is half of that, you know, half of that means of grace equation. So that's uh -huh. probably an important thing to Word and out. sacrament. For the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. And um, that formula that I mentioned, I did that on purpose, where I said repentance and forgiveness of sins. Luke 24, um, Jesus talks about that in the sending, um, that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached throughout the world. Um, 
Um, Mark um, 115, uh, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, uh, the time is fulfilled. Uh, yeah, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Um, also then, Matthew 4, 17, Jesus, again, at the start of his ministry, um, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So um, you, this is the, the, the synopsis of the entire Bible. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You've got law and gospel. Repent, law, kingdom of heaven is at hand, gospel. Uh, that's good news of salvation in, in Jesus Christ. Yeah. You almost can't receive the gospel until you repent. You can't. It's like the yeah. Holy Spirit's not can't. there to help you. Yeah. Yeah, you can't, you can't receive the gospel um, until you've, well, you can't receive the gospel until you've been faithed by, I like to turn those things into verbs, until you've been faithed by, you've been granted the faith by which you believe and receive the promises right. and blessings. Right. And you cannot receive grace, you cannot receive grace until you've repented, not because the work of repentance earns the grace, but because there, there's only forgiveness where there's sin. <laughs> so if, you know, that's why Jesus says, hey, the healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick. So, so the one who's convinced um, there is no sin cannot receive grace because the assumption is there's no, nothing to receive grace for. There's no repentance needed. Yeah. Where there's no sin, there's no forgiveness. So that's why where there's no law, there's no gospel. And then the gospel gets turned into a new kind of law. Law of one another becomes law. And uh, the gospel itself then is, is sacrificed to the law by making the gospel the law. Um, that's law gospel reductionism. It was a problem in the 70s. It's part of the whole 7X thing. It's still around today. You know, people who say, I don't want to hear any law, I just want to hear the gospel, are actually engaging in gospel reductionism, wanting to self-justify, which tr actually traps you under more law, and then makes the gospel um, either meaningless or a new kind of law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, yeah, just you have to have compassion for that and try to help them out. Yeah, for sure. So, okay, good. Uh, probably time to wrap up. We couldn't cover everything, but we'll, we'll try. And remember, whenever you have questions, you can definitely text them to me um, or uh, message me or whatever and send those. Or uh, jot them down and keep them in your book, and we'll do them um, next Sunday as, as well. So, good stuff, great questions. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you. Thank you. Thank you.